succession unfortunately in india there is no common law um you know there is no uniform civil code or anything dealing with this yet so what happens is that you have to look at various factors is you look at the religion of the person you look at the gender of the person even within religion sometimes you have to look at sects and subsects you don't make a will then it's going to be quite complicated to figure out who owns or who, who gets uh, access to your uh, uh, investments and assets but at the same time it's also no one knows what your assets are that is also the other question right now there might be a, a you know heirs who kind of but who knows what you have where in which to deposit so what we tell people is that definitely keep an asset register with you either you populate your will if you keep it with you with the will itself or you give it to someone like your accountant who will have access to it that the nominee acquires the asset from that particular institution but holds it as a trustee for the family members for the legal heirs how have you seen this industry evolve over the last few years you know the tech boom you know a lot of women have like right? women have and uh, uh, kind of move from traditional sources of 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 wealth which used to be concentrated in business families earlier to kind of now professional we have evolved from a traditional promoter business led family to like you said like a lot of new age wealth um a lot of uh, unicorn wealth that we are seeing yeah. and so that that leads to different asset classes i i think the last decade actually there has been a lot of uh, interesting evolution in, in in various different ways so when you know we used to earlier who tell people that look if you are you know failing to plan then you are planning to fail land and property disputes account for nearly 67% of civil cases in india with family disputes accounting for a further 10% more than 70000 crores of unclaimed money is currently lying in indian banks life insurance companies and provident fund accounts most of these cases are a result of poor succession and estate planning less than 10% of indians write a will versus 46% in the us and only 15% of indian family businesses have a proper succession plan in place Hello and welcome to another episode of the Prop Share podcast series. Today we are in conversation with Shesh Vikrakia who is a partner at Sri Ramachandra Mangaldas, one of the top law firms in the country. Shesh advises families and individuals on personal wealth, estate and succession planning, family business restructurings, family settlements and arrangements, trusts and wills. She has advised a wide range of clients including promoters of some of the foremost business groups in India, leading professionals and executives entrepreneurs family officers and trustees she has been completed her law degree from government law college mumbai and has been with cam for the past 8 plus years prior to which she worked at wadia gandhi and company shashvi thank you so much for coming and thank welcome you. to the podcast thank you so much for inviting me um you're also the first female guest on the on, on the podcast so uh, I thought so. I was the first non-suit person. <laughs> true, true, true. Um, so you know, estate planning is something our investors talk about a lot, and as you can see from the numbers that I just spoke about, and I'm sure you know yeah. much more than me. But um, the the proportion of people who do estate planning is 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 quite low in India, and you know that leads to all sorts of disputes from the biggest of families to the smallest of families, and the people often feel that. income level is what decides mm. you know how much estate planning you should do but that's not really true is it is like even if you have just a few lakhs in the bank it's important to make everything clear so that uh you know once uh, once you pass away then there's a proper succession planning in place and everybody who you want to be benefited gets uh, gets benefited okay so uh, let's start off with our first kind of question what what does estate planning really mean and involve very simply estate planning means organization of one's wealth and assets right. in a manner that you can use it well during your lifetime okay. and you can use it or it's available to you if you become incapacitated for whatever reason for instance if you know a person is in coma suddenly and all of their wealth is locked in right. then their family doesn't have access to even pay the medical bills right and of course planning for what happens on death right. so these are three main things when i say assets i mean not only assets that somebody owns today but also assets that they may acquire 
Right. Uh, for instance, if somebody is going to inherit property, significant property from their parents, they need to have a plan as to what they're going to do with it. Or if they're going to acquire a new property, a question they can ask themselves is, do I acquire this in my name? Right. Do I acquire this in a partnership form? Do I acquire this in my HUF? All of that involves a plan and that is pretty much your estate and succession plan. Right. And, uh, you know, we've heard of trusts, wills and so on, but what are the most popular instruments that people usually use in succession planning these days? I think there are about four things that we need to think about. The most important for me is a nomination. Right. I think it's the easiest thing to do. Not many people actually put their minds to it, but it is critical that each person puts in a nominee's name for assets where they can appoint a nominee. Right. So that would be bank accounts, DMAT accounts. If there are flats, you know, say if somebody is listening from Bombay, uh, would have flats in a corporate society, provident fund. All of these assets, life insurance, allow you to name a nominee. It's but let me, let me just be short. short then. Let's say that I yeah. do have, I appoint a nominee. Yeah. But does he really get a legal, you know, does yeah. he, can he, is, it, is it legally, yeah. I could appoint you as the nominee. But then, you know, my son could come and say, who's Sheshmi? I have a son, I should be the person. Nominee is just yes. a nominee. That's absolutely true, actually. And this is one of the most common misconceptions in the industry. Right. Even today, you will get WhatsApp messages with all sorts of things, nomination versus succession. It's, it's yeah. a very vexed topic. The summary of this position is that the nominee acquires the asset from that particular institution, but holds it as a trustee for the family members, for the legal heirs. So what right. I'll, I'll explain this a little more. See, there is a bank, there's a bank account. And that bank account has 1 lakh rupees. And the person is, you know, the patriarch of the family has appointed his son as the nominee. Um, the no when that patriarch passes away, the nominee can go to the bank and say, look, this is my father's account. I'm the nominee. You give me the money. Right. The bank will give the money to that person. Okay. But he has to hold it for the rest of the heirs. Now, if that person, if the father, say, passed away in a manner that his estate has to be divided between his wife and his son, right. then the son who is the nominee also has to give half of it to his mother, to that I person's see, wife. Right. So it's not that the money belongs to the nominee, he's the just money. holding it in Absolutely. trust. Absolutely, correct. Uh, I see. And, and, and the principle here is that a nominee is actually to benefit the institution. Today, a bank or a depository participant is not going to check who the heirs are. It's, it's, it's too much for them to do. Either you produce a court document and proof, or for them, the law has provided for a nomination facility. So it's a discharge for the bank, but for the heirs, they look to the nominee, and the nominee has to divide that asset amongst the heirs. So this is a very, very common misconception. People think I will put a nominee, and the nominee will take all the money. But that's not true. The nominee has to distribute it amongst the heirs, depending on whether a will is made or not. And, and what is the basis on which the nominee hmm. distributes this, this will? Is it a yeah. will if it's there? Or Correct. if not, I guess the Indian Succession Act, Hindu, Hindu Succession Correct. Act, the one of Correct. those, right? And so before I get to that, I want yeah. to actually just complete one thought sure, there. Sure. Uh, the only cl asset class which where this is not the case is life insurance. I see. So that. life insurance in 2015, the, the act was amended. Okay. So if you appoint a family member as a nominee for your life insurance, that person becomes beneficially entitled. So they're not holding as trustee. They can just take the money. So if, if you have a wife as a nominee, she's your relative. If you pass away, she gets the insurance proceeds. She doesn't have to distribute them to anybody. She can keep them. So only in the case yeah. of, and is it only life, it's a life, life insurance, insurance. Correct. I see. So there the nominee can actually keep the keep benefits them. of the Correct. insurance proceeds. Yes, but not any other asset class. And so now to take your question on who the nominee has to distribute it to, it's essentially the legal heirs. Right. Now how do you determine who the legal heirs are? Is you identify whether the deceased left a will, which is valid, or did not leave a will right. for that particular asset class. If they left the will which is valid, then it has to go to the person who is named in the will. Okay. And if they don't leave a will, then it has to go as per the law. Right. So essentially when somebody leaves a will, we call it testamentary succession, otherwise it's intestate. I think that's a word that's fairly commonly used, right. you know, intestate succession, is there is no will. Now intestate succession, unfortunately in India, there is no common law. Um, you know, there is no uniform civil code or anything dealing yes. with this yet. So what happens is that you have to look at various factors. These factors actually tend to get quite complex because you look at the religion of the person, you look at the gender of the person, even within religion, sometimes you have to look at sects and subsects, right. and there are other complications. So just to take the example, the most common demographic in India would be the Hindu male. A Hindu male passing away intestate, you would look at the Hindu Succession Act and 
identify who the class one heirs are. Class one heirs for a Hindu are of course the spouse and children, but also interestingly the mother. Right. So the mother gets into this mix as well. If a child has passed away, then the children of that child comes and takes their place. Right. It's slightly different for a Hindu woman. For a Hindu woman, the parents don't come into the mix. It is spouse and children. Right. If these are not there, then it comes to the heirs of the husband. And only then the parents come. Unless, of course, she has acquired any assets from the parents, then it goes back to the parents' life. Right. Right. This is for Hindus. Then, of course, for Parsis and Christians, you look at the Indian Succession Act, which is a different set of rules. And for Muslims, again, it's a different set of rules, depending on whether you're Sunni or Shia. Right. Even if you're Shia, for instance, uh, you could, you know, Kojas may be different. Right. Because their ancestors, you know, some of their ancestors were, uh, use Hindu law. Right. So there are different principles there. So it's actually a fairly complex. It's fairly principle. complicated. And you know, my favorite bit of this is because most people tend not to know is that if a, if two people from different religions get married under the Special Marriage Act, right. their personal law stops applying to them. Okay. So this is very fascinating. If an Indi if a Hindu marries a Muslim under the Special Marriage Act, which is you know going to court and getting your marriage registered, their personal law doesn't apply. And the, Hin the Indian Succession Act, as it applies to Christians, applies to them. I see. So, it, it, so neither yeah. the Hindu law nor the Muslim law will apply, but the Indian Succession Act, which applies to Correct. Christians Correct. and Parsis, will apply to them. And not Parsis, Christians. Pa only Christians. I yes. see. I see. Okay. And it's tier one. It's just one, right? There's also tier two. There's tier yeah. three. Yes. So there if, are areas. Correct. So for Hindus, if tier one is not available, then you look at tier two. For Muslims, it's slightly different. It's actually the other way around, where you have identified people who are called sharers. They take their fixed shares. Whatever remains goes to the residuaries. Right, right. And no one person can take more than a third or something like this. That is under a will. So that's okay. that's an interesting different concept. Is right. Muslims can't make a will for more than one third of their estate. I see. Unlike um, unlike everybody else in India. So what happens to the two thirds? It has to follow the law. It has to follow the law. So you can only give away one third to your favorite son. Absolutely. But the other two thirds will Correct. go to as per as per the as law. Per, unless they consent. Unless all of your other heirs consent, right. then you can give your entire estate. Okay. But if they don't consent, then it's only one third. And if you by chance have given more than your one third, then that those the, the bequests that you give under your will have to come down. So clearly, I mean if you don't make a will, yeah. then it's going to be quite complicated to figure out who right. owns or who, who gets yeah. Uh, yeah. access to your uh, uh, investments and assets. But at the same time, it's also no one knows what your assets are. That is also the other question. Correct. Right now, there might be a, a, you know, a heirs who kind of, but who knows what you have, where, in which fixed deposit. Absolutely. People don't really, you know, especially if something happens suddenly, hmm. then you don't really plan or, or have a diary where you've written yeah. everything where people know. That's the other kind of Absolutely. Big that is that is a big problem and that's an absolutely, it's a non-legal problem, but it's an extremely practical problem. Um, in terms of there is no asset register concept in India, right? Yeah. So there is nobody has access. You may have to file something in your tax returns, but even then, not not your entire estate. So what we tell people is that definitely keep an asset register with you. Either you populate your will and you keep it with you, with the will itself, or you give it to someone like your accountant who will have access to it. And it's not just your assets. Uh, along with your assets, identify who the joint holders are, who the nominees are, yeah. because the nominee should know they're a nominee. Yeah, exactly. Along with that, you have passwords for your digital assets, and also for your locker, the key. Keys are very important because we've had clients who um, their parents may have a bank locker, but they've lost the key. The seventy thousand crores we talked about in banks. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. It could be a lot more than that. You never know what's in the locker. So th there was a very strange situation for us because they knew the locker was there. There was no nomination, there was no key, and the, that particular institution said, sorry, as per the rules, you have to go to court, get an order, and or we obtained an order after many months. That order was sent to Godrej, because these safes are, you know, sort of very heavy duty ones. Someone from Godrej came and had identified time along with the court officer, along with us, opened that whole thing. The right. client obviously had to pay for it, and then access whatever. I hope there was something valuable in there. <laughs> there was, there was, I, I don't know if there's anything valuable, but the only thing they wanted to ensure is there's no will inside. Ah, because that's right, the other right, mistake right. that people make is they put their wills in their bank lockers okay. and their heirs will have absolutely no idea whether there's a will or not. Right, right. And you know, you looked at international law, I'm sure. How is it bit different, Indian mm -hmm. law versus, you know, let's yeah. say American law mm -hmm. or European law in yeah. this regard? Is it also similar? No, it, it would be different. So let's take European law first. Um, a lot of Europe, so not UK, because I think we're entirely sort of based on the UK law, so right. we're very similar in that sense. Uh, but on the continent, 
the law tends to be different. So for instance, in, in some European countries like France, for instance, it's similar to Muslim law, where there is a concept of forced airship. Uh, so you cannot leave everything by will to whoever you want to. Some part will definitely, as for law, be held for identified family members. Um, the US is similar in that sense. You have testamentary freedom. Again, each state there will have different formalities that you need to do. But the interesting thing about the UK and the US is they have uh, inheritance tax or estate oh, yeah. duty. 40% in the UK. Which, which we don't have yeah. in uh, India. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's, a big, uh, that's mm. been a big problem there for some of the right. uh, landed yeah. kind of gentry who have been owning a lot of land Absolutely. and pass it on. Suddenly the thing is that you have, a let's say, a, a hundred crore castle or an estate, mm. but you yeah. have to pay 45% of that, Correct. but then you need to sell it as well. You don't so have the liquidity kind of, to do that, exactly. So that's a good thing, a big Correct. problem there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, will being the most common mm. kind of instrument that people use. Tell yeah. us something more about how how do you write a will, who mm. are the people that you should put in there, yeah. the, you know, how does it work? So, will is actually one of the most simple documents to write. You know, the good thing about the law in India is that there are barely any formalities. I, right. I think we sort of create it as some big mm. legal document, but essentially it is something that you can sit on your dining table and write out on your right. own. Probably all the Bollywood movies initially, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but you can even yeah. send an email, right? No, no, an email actually doesn't work anyway okay. because in India, in India at least, uh, you, you need uh, there is no concept of a digital will as yet. Right. right. So, in India, you still need a written will. A wedding signature. A wedding signature. And so it has to be written, there has to be a wedding signature. And importantly, you have to have two witnesses witnessing you doing that. So this was a problem during COVID uh, because, you know, video attestation is not permitted. So you needed two people to sit with you. To and see. independent people or just even family members, anyone is fine? For the most part, family members is But fine. how do you know the person was in the room when you were kind of doing it? You can't text us. Just... So they, the, the thing is, the reason you need witnesses is to confirm that you actually signed your will. So after right. you pass away, if there is a, any question on the will, whether you signed it, whether it's a forgery, they will confirm that you did. And in, uh, where you have to file a probate, typically one witness at least has to give an affidavit. They have to sign on notes that they saw you sign at the time that you said you were signing. Later, after, 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 you, after you passed away, after you okay. passed away. So it's important. It could be anybody, to be honest. For at least for Hindus, there is there isn't a, an issue on you know whether it's a beneficiary or not. The what we suggest to people is you have someone who is accessible to the family because if they need an affidavit, they can't go roaming around the world. Right. You know, it, 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 sometimes people come to our office and say you sign for us, but I can be one of the signatories at max. But definitely the other person should be someone that that person has ready access to. Right to be able to confirm that they've done that. So witnesses could pretty much be anybody. Okay. Um, preferably younger than the person because you want them to outlive the, the person who is making yeah. the will. Yeah. Trustworthy, of course. Yeah. So all of these things you would take into mind. But otherwise, in a will, you know, it's really, you can take a white piece of paper, you can type out on it, you can write your wishes. The important thing, and you can have two uh, witnesses witnessing it. The important thing to bear in mind is what are the ingredients that you need to think about. Right. One is you need to name somebody who will execute your wishes that you have named in the will. Right. Which is called an executor. Okay. So you can have one executor, you can have two, you can have some sort of combination. You can say if this person can you make a law firm an executor? So in India, you cannot have a partnership firm as your executor. You can name an you can name say a designation. You can, for instance, say that the managing partner of Siranamachand Mangalas. Will be the you can't say Sir Ramachand Mangal Das is my executor. Not, not in India because a partnership is not a person per se and can't right. obtain a probate. So essentially you are naming one person saying the managing partner of this person or so and so who is the partner of this person. If, if not there then the next person who is the managing okay. partner something like that. So this is the executor. This is the executor. What you, can't, you, know, you may not be able to name a partnership, uh, law firm but there are professional service providers in the market that offer executorships. So these are companies. Uh, that for a fee, which you will agree with them during your life, you can write their name in your will as executor and when you pass away, they will then execute it right. for you. So right. if you don't have a family member who is available to do that, you can always engage a professional. Uh, you have that. to have an executor. It, your will is not invalid if you don't have an executor, but the thing is somebody needs to execute it. So what happens if you don't have an executor is that your family will have to go to court and, and court appoint court themselves court. as administrators. Oh. So it's just an extension, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, sort of bureaucracy or unnecessary introducing by not having an right. executor. So ideally, definitely have one. 
name someone who would be an alternative because that person may pass away and not be available, may not want to act as executor. You know, executors yeah. are not bound to do this. Right. They can, he needs to sign the will. No, saying, oh, okay. no, he doesn't. You should inform them because okay. if you don't want to spring it on them at the last right, minute right, after right. you passed away, he'll be like, okay, well, he or she will yeah. not know what is hit to them. So you want to tell them that I'm going to name you as executor. Uh, sometimes you can write a letter to them, you can inform them orally, I'm going to do this. So they're aware that they're going to have to take on this responsibility. Okay. Uh, if they're not willing to do that, then there's no point in naming them in the first okay. place. Okay. So you should definitely have executors. The third part of this is, of course, uh, you have to name who gets yours. And the most important part is the bequests. The beneficiaries. The beneficiaries. So you identify what assets you want to give to whom. Um, family members, non-family members. In India, it's entirely up to you. You're not bound to give it to a particular person or a relative. You can right. just you can give everything to charity if you want. Okay. Um, so people do that as well. And uh, the other thing is in India, you can also, if you have minor children, appoint a guardian for them under your will. Right. So the parents can actually do that. So if something happens to both the parents, then the person named in the will will automatically become a testamentary guardian. Right. Which is important because if you don't do that, then somebody from the family, grandparents or whatever, will have to go to court and get themselves appointed. Right. So why do that? If you can name, you know, if you have a minor child, you can name a guardian in their will and they just, just take office if both the parents have passed away. Okay. So basically you could take a piece of paper, write down your assets, yeah. who you want each of these assets to go to. Uh, 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 once you pass away and then you need to definitely have two witnesses who Correct. can sign this will. Yeah. You need to mention who the executor of the will uh, yeah. will be and also speak to the person to tell Correct. them that you are the executor and who the beneficiary of your uh, yeah. uh, will is. So you don't need to tell the beneficiaries anything yeah. because you can change your will. I mean I make right. a will today and tomorrow I can change it. So yeah. Your beneficiaries don't need to know. Your witnesses don't need to know anything. They're just confirming that they've seen you sign. Executors don't need to know what is in the will. But they need to know that they are executors. Yes, so only you know what is the, what is in the will. Correct. That, that yeah. one yeah. situation. And and so, so to just to complete this because these questions get asked an awful yeah. lot. Um, is no stamp duty is required. You yeah. don't need a stamp paper. You don't need a notarization of your will. You don't need to go to a notary and get anyone to sign it. And registration is not compulsory. So this is a common misconception that you need to register a will or if deals with immovable property you need to register, you don't need to register. It's not compulsory. It's good in a sense that if there are likely to be any suspicions on your will, then it helps dispel some of those suspicions. It, 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 there, it's evidence that the will may be genuine. It's evidence that the will is dated of a particular day. It is of that day, but it's not going to 100% foolproof your will. Right. And it's definitely not mandatory. Right, right. And then you spoke about this probate, okay. right? Yeah. Some some states and cities yeah. require probate. What, right. what does that mean? Probate essentially is a word which means to prove the will. Okay. It proves the genuineness. It's, it's a court stamp that this will is certified as true because right. the court has examined that. Right. In India, there are some places where it's compulsory to get a probate if the will was signed in those places or if there is immovable property in those places. So those three are essentially, broadly speaking, uh, Mumbai, Chennai and Calcutta. Right. The whole three residency towns. Right. So if you have a prop immovable property in Mumbai or you made that bill in Mumbai, then you have to go to the Bombay High Court. You, when I say you, is basically after you passed away, the executor. So you can't do this before you, you pass away, you have to do it after, after you pass After. The will only becomes active after the person has passed away. Okay. When that person passes away, the executor named that will has to go to the court and said, I want to seek a probate for it. Please confirm that this is valid. Right. The court will get a witness to give an affidavit, examine if there are no contentious, you know, if it's not contentious, if there's nobody challenging the will, then they will stamp it saying this is will is proved, it is correct. In other places, probate is not compulsory. And uh, so for instance, in Bangalore, it's not compulsory, but sometimes you may need to get a probate. An example of that would be if you have a bank account and you don't have a nomination. Right. The bank is not going to release the money because there's no nominee. They'll tell you that, okay, if you want to claim this money, please prove that you're actually genuinely the heir. How do you prove that? Is your name in the will? Fine. Please confirm that this will is proved. Get a probate from the court. Right. So even if it's not compulsory, some institutions may require you to actually get a probate or an equivalent court document. I see. I see. Okay. And uh, coming to the second most used instrument after hmm. will, it's trust. Trust, right? yeah. And you hear this word a lot, trust, or a trust yeah. fund kid, or you know, yeah, trust okay. being used for various things. 
Tell us about trusts. How, how are they structured? How are they different from wills? And when you should be using a trust versus a will? So trust and wills are actually two very you know entirely different concepts. So will is a document that comes into force after your life. Right. A trust is um, I mean, it's very technical, but it's basically some sort of vehicle that you can create. When I say vehicle, tech, legally it's not a vehicle, but we'll, for this purpose of this conversation, just to make it easier, we'll say it's a separate entity that you're creating. Essentially, what you're doing is you're identifying one person who is the trustee to hold some assets for the people you want to ultimately benefit. Right. So just to strip this down into a your life example, I have a minor child. And uh, if I'm worried that, you know, if something happens to me, then, you know, that minor, if that minor child will inherit my property, yeah. but he or she is not going to be able to hold it. I mean, that kid is the three-year-old kid. So I might want to create a trust for them. So what I will do is I will identify someone who I trust as a trustee. Okay. It could be you. Okay. And I come to you saying, Kunal, look, I have these shares of my company. I want to put them in my trust so that if something were to happen to me, I'm, you know, I might be seriously unwell. If something were to happen to me, please hold this asset as trustee for my child. So if there are shares, any dividend comes on those shares, use that income for the benefit of my child and my child becomes major. You can be very specific. You can be very specific. So in India, trusts are created for essentially, I think they become very popular with two classes. One is business families to hold business assets. And the second is when there are dependents. Right. So when I say dependents, I mean minors in our example, or if there's an elderly parent, or if there is a disabled member of the family. Right and the disabled member cannot take care of themselves, essentially you can create a trust for them, saying for all of their lifestyle, medical expenses, somebody will use that asset and pay them. That person cannot use it for themselves. They're bound by law only to use it for that benefit. And you can't say this in a will. Like in a will, for example, let's say I yeah. give so much to my right. yep. brother, yeah. but you need to make sure that my father is well taken care of Correct. and he should be yeah. in this particular house. He should not be thrown out. Correct. Can you say all that in a will or for that do you need a... So you can, so there are, I think there are various different aspects to this. You can create a trust under your will also, that's called a testamentary trust. Okay. So essentially a trust that you're creating during your lifetime, you're creating under a will. Uh, the other thing you can of course do is, say if you're worried about a father being, you know, removed from the house, you can give that father life interest. Right. And say that during my father's lifetime, he will have an interest in the property. Right. He cannot sell it of course. After he passes away, it will automatically go to my brother. So he is then safeguarded. You can also say that you can give it to your brother saying that during you know your life during my father's life our father's lifetime he will stay you will allow him to stay. But those are slightly um, you know it, it's challenging as to whether they can actually be enforced yeah. because if the father is removed at that point um, whether a court will uphold that kind of restriction and all is remains to be seen. And any given point of time that father will have to go to court. It's not effective to do that. Okay. So essentially then you can create these kinds of trusts during your lifetime. You can do both and just to take it, you know, the next step, if there's immovable property, there's a flat, there's stamp duty in me putting that flat into the trust. But if I do it under a will, I don't have to pay stamp duty. But isn't that only where it's an irrevocable trust or is it no. in any, any trust? A any trust. So if you put it in a trust, you need to pay stamp. Can you take it back? You can if it's a revocable right. trust. So it just it, there are two kinds of trusts. There's revocable ones where I put the property, I can take it back, and there's irrevocable that once I put the property, I can't take it back. Mm -hmm. So, but stamp duty, if I'm moving in any immovable property, I have to pay. And and irrevocable is much more uh, uh, stronger, hmm. isn't it? Like once you do an irrevocable yeah. trust, then it's more or less it's out of your hands now, it's and no one can really come and get that asset. You're green fencing that asset into this trust versus the revocable. You are in some ways uh, <coughs> ring fencing and again this is, you know, there are many different uh, there's nuances and complexities to these kinds of things. Uh, essentially, I think the important thing in a trust is to identify control. Right. I think that's the most, the key word is once you put an asset into the trust, who controls that asset and depending on who controls it. So I could make an irrevocable trust but still say that for I will have decision making powers. So, I mean, let's say that uh, I put something in a trust mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I go bankrupt in my family business right. and the banker now wants to take everything that he yeah. can. Yeah. Can he come and take what is there in the trust? So that's the key word. The, the, the important thing is there is control. control. Like so if you don't control, then you can't. Yeah, you if really you're not controlling, it's entirely out of your So that means the trustee is controlling what that trust is Correct. doing. Correct. 
Now again, like there are nuances. I mean, if you uh, if if you know that you were you're going to become bankrupt, then, and then yeah, you yeah. move that asset out, you know the bankruptcy laws, the courts will come right, and right, right. Uh, stop that kind of thing from happening. Okay. Uh, but see, if I moved it, and ten years later I become bankrupt, my asset, which is in a trust which I don't have access over, you know, the court is not going to be able to say that that forms part of my estate. Um, so it, it is a, a trust does form you know one of those uh, ring fencing sort of models, but right. one has to tread with caution when 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 thinking about something like and, that. And I mean, could you also do things like I don't want this to go to my son or daughter until you know at least they should finish graduation. Yeah. You can put some stuff like that, right? can you? Trusts are actually great for that kind of thing. Okay. So especially when one wants to, you know, push the, when the child will get. Yeah. How much he gets also, right? How much? At twenty, you give him ten percent. At twenty-one, Absolutely. only five percent. All Absolutely. of these things. So we get these questions a lot because most people recognize that at the age of 20, 30, they don't want their children to have access to large amounts of wealth. Right. It's not good for their growth either, or you know, if it's business wealth, it's not good for the business as well. Right. So they will come to us with a model with different milestones as to when they want their children to benefit from that. Uh, most people, and I say most people, this is not like some sort of rule, but typically we have seen that 35 or 40 is a good age when people feel that their children will be comfortable accessing a, a, a certain amount of wealth. Till then, the trustee has is given instructions that you will use it for them. So for their marriage, for their education, for their general lifestyle needs. If they need money, they'll come to you, you use the income and you pay them. Or you pay them or you pay the institution directly. Like if they're in, you know, they need it for medical, if they're in a hospital, you could pay the hospital directly. Right. But the actual assets, you know, can either be given to them only after 35 or don't give it at all. Okay. So many trusts are created in a way that um, the actual asset cannot be distributed to the beneficiary till the trust is terminated. Right. Which could be 70, 80 years so later. So other than a trustee, who else is involved in a trust? Is there anyone else? Let's say four, four people. Okay. One is the settlor, is the person who creates the trust. Okay. The second, of course, is the trustee who holds the asset in trust. The third is the beneficiaries, is the people who benefit from the trust. Right. The people who will get the income and the actual corpus from it. These three are recognized in the Indian Trust Act. There is a fourth one, um, which is more of a development in practice that we have imported now in India from offshore practices, okay. which is, you know, some kind of protective office, which is either called a protector or some other name, administrator, protector, something like that. Right. And this is essentially, you can give the protector whatever powers, it's an entirely flexible, it's up to you. You can decide what powers you want to give them. But essentially, the protector is intended, as the name suggests, to protect the interests of the beneficiaries. Right. So, if the beneficiary were a minor, they don't, they can't control what the trustee is doing. So, what the parent will do is appoint somebody as a protector, maybe their own parent. Like I can appoint my parent as a protector and say that whatever the trustee is doing, please keep tab of this. Right. So, the trustee has to give them information, has to give accounts, some for some key decisions, has to take consent from the protector, and then only they can take certain uh, decisions. Uh, the next kind of question, which is quite, uh, you know, which, we, which we, we ourselves get quite often, is a large part of Indians now work abroad, right? Mm -hmm. They live abroad, yeah. either they've got US you know, citizenship or yeah. they might be a green card or a PR holder or right. just a non resident Indian. Yeah. So, how is, how is you know, making a will or a trust different for, for, for these yeah. guys? Is it just yeah. the same or does the same laws apply or how, how does it work? So in India, your residential status or nationality doesn't depend or, or doesn't influence how you can make a will. Okay. It's pretty much like you said, your religion. Okay. And so NRIs or foreign citizens can make a will in India in the same manner as an Indian person. They can also inherit in the same manner. So if there was, if there was a father with a son who's living in the US, um, they can make a will and that child in the U US can inherit. So right. inheritance from a foreign exchange perspective in India is agnostic. Uh, but what you should bear in mind is <coughs> if that child inherits, you know, if, if there's a foreign uh, child, inherits property, they can't, if they sell it in India, they can take only $1 million outside per year. Ah, the LRS. So, so it, it's, it's, it's not the LRS. LRS is 250. 250, That yeah. increases to a million. There's a million on debt. Correct. On but inheritance. current income you can. Current yes. income you can freely can. Yeah. Interest, uh, dividend, all absolutely. of this, there is no limit. You there's can no get limit. 20 million interest, you're fine. Absolutely. But if, it, if it's a capital asset that you're selling, if you're inheriting a flat, 
or a bungalow and you're selling that, you can take only one million per year unless you get approval from the RBI. Right, right. What, what, what if, what if, sorry, mm. what if, uh, what if he's a, uh, a UK citizen, you said mm. UK has it. Now, does the 45% apply to him? No, not, not to an Indian <coughs> person. Like right. if, if um, somebody in India who has no connection to the US, UK or the US except having that child there, that person's estate will not be no, come. He, he is a resident. The beneficiary right. is one is he is a resident. On his death. So inheritance tax will apply to somebody who has UK or US connections on their death, not when they are inheriting. So when you inherit something, you don't pay inheritance tax? No, tax. no. Your, your inheritance tax and estate duty is paid when you are I see. passing okay. away. So it's the person who's given the... Uh, uh, yeah, so estate. inheritance tax essentially is basically in the UK, it is inheritance, so you, you do pay when you get, but that is if you are getting it from somebody in the UK to whom inheritance tax applies. Right, right, right. Not if you are inheriting from someone in India. So if India. you are a British citizen and yeah. you inherit, inherit something in India from your father, yeah. then uh, inheritance doesn't right. apply, but when you pass away, yeah. then, uh, then your inheritance family would, tax yeah, uh, applies, irrespective of where you are tax resident. That would be a nuance. I am not okay. the US UK <coughs> nuance. Uh, there, there are various different right, nuances right. to that. So th I wouldn't uh, claim to be an expert okay. on that. You need to kind of go to the tax guy. Absolutely. Very clearly. And not just before you get, you know, bef before you. I mean, already of people who are already US and UK resident or tax, uh, you know, tax in that country, of course, now don't have the option. But there are a lot of people who want to go to those countries, and our advice to them is that before you go, six months before you go, you plan. Consult someone in India, consult someone in that relevant country, plan your affairs in India in such a way that these assets in India are not covered by any taxes that you have abroad. Right, right, right. Okay. And uh, the other key thing there is actually, because it's a very important question that gets asked of us a lot, is yeah. that if somebody is a non-resident with multi-jurisdictional assets, yeah. do they make one worldwide will or do they make separate wills? And this separate is Separate is usually advised, right? For the most part, for the most part, unless there is a specific reason that they want to create one will, because we had somebody who was trying to balance various assets in creating, I'll give so much to X person, but if my assets in this country are not enough, then from the US, so we had to make one will because it was structured in such right, a way. Right, right, right. But if that is not the case, definitely multi So then, I mean, wouldn't you have two wills? Yeah. Aren't you supposed to have only one, one will? One will in one particular jurisdiction. So in India, you should ideally have only one will because if you have two wills, then typically the one that's after okay, so you can have two wills in two jurisdictions. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. Okay. Okay. So you would and and why is this advice? Why is it that you hmm. should have two wills? One for Indian assets, one for US yeah. assets. So there are various reasons. One of them, of course, is uh, each country has different formalities. So like we said, in India, it's fairly easy to make a will. You know, white paper, two witnesses. That's okay. Other countries uh, like Singapore follow something similar, but there may be other countries where this is not the case. Like you said, France has right. forced airship. There may be other formalities. The second is executors you want in the local area. So if Indian assets, I want an executor here, in and you know American assets, I want an executor there. Otherwise, those people will have to keep flying to get you know even basic formalities done. Right. Second, the third is of course probate. Because uh, if probate is required in two different jurisdictions, you can't do it simultaneously. You have to get it probated in one country first, take that and go to the second country. So effectively, you're doubling the time. Whereas if you have two wills, you can simultaneously start the probate process for both. Okay. Uh, and now the final kind of, kind of structure that we've seen quite a bit and, and increasingly becoming popular these days is family offices. Yeah. Right? What are family offices and how are they different? What do they do in, in, yeah. in succession planning? So I wouldn't call a family office tool a succession planning yeah. structure in a, in a sense. It's not something that you put in place to think about what happens to you after your death. But succession, it, it is definitely an estate planning tool. Now a family office is takes various different forms. I mean, we worked with various different clients. Uh, and for various different people, families, the term means different things. So essentially, it is either a vehicle or a group of people that you employ to undertake certain actions and services for you, right. which could be as basic as a concierge service. So if you have a large family, these people will book your plane tickets, they will manage your accounts, they will manage your taxes, you know, all of the things that you need to maintain your lifestyle. It could also be, you know, if you have somebody has a private jet, for instance, it could be housed in that particular company and different family members can use it. It could be as simple as that. 
or it could be an extremely sophisticated wealth management tool. So in India often we use family offices in the context of wealth management or investment. So the family's wealth will be pooled in a particular vehicle which should be a company or partnership or a trust right. and then used to invest down. Various instruments, other yes, companies, instruments. private investments and so on, your house is all under one LLP or or, or or a company or something like yeah. that, then appoint people to manage that. Oh, exactly, you appoint professionals to manage that for you. And, and this single office, uh, so it's because it, it you know deals with a particular one family, it's called a single family office. There are of course service providers that do this for multiple families, which are multi-family offices. And this could be pretty much your you know man Friday and right. take care of all the family's needs. So you could have professionals there who also help with your succession planning. They will file your nominations, they will do your wealth management, they will house, keep custody of all of the relevant important documents in your family. So it's pretty much your service provider to take care of all of your lifestyle needs. Okay. And uh, finally, just in terms of your own in experience of the last decade or so of doing this, how have you seen this industry evolve over the last yeah. few years? Yeah. You know, the tech boom created a lot of millionaires, right. billionaires, and uh, uh, kind of moved from traditional sources of, of, yeah. of, of wealth, which used to be concentrated in business families yeah. earlier to Correct. kind of now professionals. Yeah. Uh, how, how have you seen that landscape change? Hmm. Uh, I mean, you yourself said yeah. you, you moved to Bangalore from, yeah. from Mumbai, right? right. So how is it? How is that? How have you seen that? Uh, I, I think the last decade actually there has been a lot of uh, interesting evolution in, in, in various different ways. So when you know we used to earlier go tell people that look if you are you know failing to plan then you are planning to fail. A large part of what we had to do originally was to educate people saying look you need to plan. I think a lot of education now already ha has happened in the industry. People are aware that they actually need to think about things. Uh, trusts and all is a conversation that not many people used to have till suddenly there was you know then an estate duty conversation but now we see all of these conversations happen increasingly people are have become more aware of what they need to at least that they need to do something if not what they need to do people talk to each other so I think that's a good thing that as a you know as a, as a society as a community we have become more aware so the awareness of the awareness has definitely increased uh, what the next step of this is actually to take that awareness into actually doing things, yeah. which is also something that you know we've seen increasing traction. So this is people recognize this is important but not urgent. Right. So sometimes it gets put on the back burner. We have increasingly seen people who are interested in this. Now, in terms of the you know the sophisticated the wealth models, like you said, right? We we have evolved from a traditional promoter business-led family to like you said, like a lot of new age wealth. Um, a lot of uh, unicorn wealth that we're seeing yeah. and so that that leads to different asset classes for instance now we have to think about AIFs yeah. and you know a lot of people having AIF units what to do about those ESOPs uh, ESOPs is not so much a conversation but now increasingly we're seeing you know conversations about ESOPs succession to ESOPs what happens when someone passes away with an ESOP um, the digital assets crypto assets again right. conversations that weren't happening before but increasingly new asset classes new asset classes are uh, so the traditional ones you know still remain but there are new ones and the ways of holding these <coughs> have changed uh, very few HUFs now you know yeah. very anyone talks about HUFs yeah. although there is something that was very popular some years ago whereas increasing conversation about trusts right. trust model has become more sophisticated as well um, you know, there used to be some more simpler versions of trust, say, a decade ago, but now we have adopted so many of these international best practices that how we create these is, you know, the, the, the ingredients to what we put in a trust deed has also become so much more sophisticated. Right. So across, it's been, uh, it's, you know, it's sort of almost, uh, as a professional, it's an exciting time for me, but I'm also very pleased that the people, the public is also, you know, yeah, putting yeah, these sure. things I mean, in. A lot of the new age wealth and sort of hobblers, etc., they are quite adventurous in terms of where they want to put money. Crypto, Correct. for example, a lot of yeah. private investments and other startups, private companies, Correct. it's no longer putting it in FD or gold and so on. So then you also need to educate yourself Absolutely. on what those new asset classes are and Absolutely. how you can make sure that they uh, continue to Correct. be held in yeah. benefit for someone even if he wants to. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Sergio. That was very enlightening. I, I mean, I myself learned a lot of things, uh, and I'm sure there are lots of our clients who are interested in something like this. And, uh, you know, we'll happily push them uh, uh, your, your way. Uh, and in the future, hopefully, we can also 
work together and see if uh, uh, you know there's something that we can we can do for some of these uh, some of these individuals. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kunal. It was a very interesting conversation, and thank you for spending this time with me. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as we did, and uh, we'll see you next time with the next uh, with another guest on another topic in the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you.